So the bema seed of Christ, that is a Greek word, bema seed of Christ. Uh, you may have just seen it titled as the judgment seat of, of, of Christ, the judgment for the Christians. Now there, I've seen with very well-meaning Christians, with very knowledgeable Christians, there seems to be a misunderstanding on what happens to us when we die or what happens to us when we are raptured and, and, and up in heaven with God. Um, well, up in the air, technically speaking. Um, I've heard a lot of Christians think that God is going to bring up our dirty laundry in the rapture and all that was in the dark comes to light. I believe that verse, if you look at it again, of what's in the darkness will come to light. It's speaking on earth. Those things in the darkness will come to light. At the same time, your good deeds, although they were hidden, they will come to light here. But I do not believe, and I'll show you the evidence of why I state that, that we will be judged for our sins when we come up to heaven. God promised us that he got our sins and threw them into the deepest of oceans. Why would he bring them back up? I thought you said you forgot. I thought you said you forgave. Um, he's kind of doing like what a lot of us do when we say we forgive someone. If if that were the case, he would be doing what some of us do where, no, no, I forgive you. And then two months later, half of you did that. I remember it. That that sounds more of something that we tend to do. But I think that's in contrast to, to what God said that he was going to do. I believe God is consistent. But let's look at this because I think this is something that should always exist in the back of, of the mind of a believer. In particular, this verse and, and, and the things that apply to it. The fact that we are saved, in my, in my view of how I see things, the fact that we are saved, the fact that, that you know we read God's word and that we pray, that is elementary stuff. That is elementary stuff. We need to do it. But that is elementary stuff. If the disciples were still debating on that, even after Christ resurrected, like we would have never gotten the Gospels. The goal is to serve God, whether that means going out or teaching or, or, or whatever it is, or, or, or doing a missions trip or, or, or communing with different believers. But to grow in that sense, to seek the spirit of God, to 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 edify the church, all these things, that is what's key. If we're still debating, which I understand, we all go through struggles, but if we're just struggling to go to church on Sunday, to me, going to church on Sunday, again, my opinion, going to church on a Sunday is not the, the pinnacle of Christianism, or however you want to call it. That That is not you. That's you sitting down and receiving that is not the goal of our Christian life, to sit down and receive. Aside from church on Sunday, what do you do to give? Unless you, you're purposefully serving on, on a Sunday service or, or, or on a service. Aside from that, what are you doing to give, to, 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 to serve? That is the purpose, to serve, to be like Christ is to serve. He washed the feet. He washed the feet of, of all his disciples. Um, but I wanted, I just wanted to start by saying that. So this is the verse um, where it, it speaks on the judgment that we'll receive. Anyone who builds on that foundation, the foundation of Christ, will use a variety of materials. So we're building on the foundation that we have, the foundation that Jesus is the son of God. We're building upon the church um, and, and it's through our works. Now, we may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, that's one category, and wood, hay, and straw. These are easily burned. These are precious metals. Um, but on the judgment day, the Bema Seed of Christ, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder, each individual Christian has done. That fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward, and we'll speak on that also. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Now, one of the things I want to talk about in respects to the difference of 
um, these cat this category and that category of the gold, silver, jewels, and the wood, hay, straws, and it testing whether it is good or not, whether it is useful or not. Well, that's the key word. It's not about whether this is good and that's bad. Again, this does not signify bad. God is not bringing up our sin. What he is bringing up is the utility. The same, the same way in the English how you can say, I have a good car and I have a bad car. You do not have a morally corrupt car. You have a useless car if it is a bad car. If you have a good car, it is useful. It does exactly what you need it to do. So a good car would fall over here. A bad car falls over here. Um, it, it's speaking on the, on the utility of this. Part of the trick is for us understanding, but part of the problem, the, the difficulty is us trying to understand what in my life, when I'm serving God, what constitutes as this and what constitutes as that. How do I know that what I'm doing, is it in vain? Will it be burned up or will it last forever? How does God view it? And that's that's a little bit challenging to to figure that out. And, and I want to be careful with what I say concerning that, because um, that could definitely hurt a lot of Christians. It, it definitely has to be something that the Holy Spirit shows you. But at the same time, we can get some context clues by looking at that. Now, another thing that I want to point out is that regardless, even if all you did was build on straw, or even if you didn't build anything, but let's just say even if all you built on was on straw and it all got burnt up and whoop, well, your whole ministry you know, disappeared. <laughs> it does not mean that you lost salvation. That And that's the key thing to remember. The biggest reward is the fact that we are with the Lord in heaven. The fact that we are together with him. You may build on straw. You may even build on nothing per se. Yeah, like the like the like the thief on the cross next to Jesus. What did he build on? Nothing. He was saved that moment and then died a few moments later. He still made it up into heaven. Did he have really work to show for it? Not really. But to a believer that you know has the benefit of, of being saved for maybe 50, 80 years, hey man, they got a lot of time to build. So that uh, there's a benefit there. But at the end of the day, the key reward. It's the fact that we're in heaven with God. So regardless, the builder is saved. The fact that we are a part of this, we are saved. It mentions it right there. The, build, the builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. And that should also concern us a bit. We're saved, but it's like you did nothing. <laughs> you did nothing with your faith. You did nothing with, with everything that God has given you. And, and I feel like it relates a lot to that parable of of the three servants with the talents were given these giftings by God. And if we do nothing with it, what does God tell? So there's, there's, um, there's two servants, one multiplied it, I don't know, by 10 maybe. And the other multiplied it by two, but God gave the same praise to both of them. He said, um, well done, good and faithful servant, because you've been given a few, I will give you more. It is the same exact praise, like word for word. It is the same exact praise. But the one who hid it and did nothing with it, what key word does God tell them? Not, oh, I understand that you were scared and hidden and this and that. No, he calls them lazy. You lazy servant. You could have done more for me. I, I could have at least put my, my money in the parable. I could have at least put my money in the bank and gotten some interest on it. But the, the key rebuke that he gives is that you were lazy. You may have been saved and going every Sunday, but if you did nothing and never spoke to anybody about Christ and, and never did anything, you're lazy. That is the rebuke that God gives us. He loves us and we're saved and, and he forgave us of our sins and he's happy that we have a communion with him. But he rebukes us and says, you are lazy. Oh, I hope I never fall into that category. Um. So regardless, the builder is saved. Being saved is the ultimate reward. The judgment is based on the value of their work, whether it is useful or useless. Like the car analogy I gave you, not whether it is good or evil. Again, we're not being judged because of our sins. And again, we'll speak on this beam of seat, on this judgment seat that, that it's speaking of. If our sins died with Christ, then our day in court was 2,000 years ago. 
Um, I, I, I want to go off a little bit on a tangent to explain something of how God works in essentially legalistic terms. Um, how, how I put it before, God doesn't just, you know, clap his hands and, oh, we're saved because we're saved. No, Jesus had to die. And there's a purpose of why Jesus had to die because God stated that the payment for sin is death. Now, why? Why is God following on his own rules? Why, why did God create a rule and, and is also following through with it? Well, God is consistent, first of all. But at the same time, what do we see in the book of Job? Who is it that's speaking with God? It is Satan, the accuser. The accuser. So let's look at, let's look at a court of law. You have the judge, who is God. You have one lawyer, the, 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 I'm, I'm not sure the uh, defendant, um, I'm not sure what the key words are, but there's two sides. There, there's one fighting a uh, case and one fighting against that individual. Satan would have been that individual fighting against it. No, you, they should go to hell. Look, they did this, they did that, they did that. And it's funny that that would be Satan's job, trying to get more people into hell because he knows what he's condemned to. But he's known as the accuser. The prosecutor, there you go, thank you. He is known as the prosecutor. So now when Jesus, so Satan as a prosecutor is saying, look, look at everything they did. God is looking at it. God, who is just, he can't just be like, throw out the papers. I don't care about that. That's not how God is. His nature does not allow for that. He is just. He is merciful, but he is just. He is gracious, but he is just. So now when Jesus comes along, and having that sacrifice, yes, he is our defendant. So Satan may have accused us with this long list of things that I've done all throughout my life. But Jesus comes and says, but it was paid for. And tells the judge, but it was paid for with blood, this blood. And now because of that, his, his, his defense is thrown out. The prosecutor's defense is thrown out. And now God, the judge, can, can, can claim you're saved, you're good, you're clean. But it had to follow a legalistic line. Um, uh, and God is consistent in that sense. So let, let's continue with the beam seat of Christ. Um, so although we may see it in English as judgment seat, it does it injustice to look at the, 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 the minuscule uh, mentions that it's trying to say in the Hebrew, in, I'm sorry, in the Greek. I'm really stumbling over all my words today. Um, so Bema, uh, you can find that in, in Strong's G968. Now, when this word is used, mind you, we also have Greek literature to use as reference of when that word was used. And Bema seat is essentially a platform, a tribune, like the Olympics, where you got first place, second place, third place, that kind of thing. The official seat of a judge uh, the judgment seat of Christ. These are the different times it's been used. And Herod. So this is a uh, this is a more of a when it's used in Greek literature. Herod built a structure resembling a throne in Caesarea, from which he viewed the games and made speeches to the people. So it's from that bema seat. It's from that judgment seat where he's now judging essentially the 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 the, the Olympic players per se. Um, and and he's and he's saying, okay, yeah, you got first place, you got second place, whatever it is. Um, but that's what that looks like. Now that is in contrast to this Greek word again in the English, judge, judgment seat. In other words, but the Hebrew word, I'm, the Greek word is completely different. Krino, which comes from the the our English word criteria. Well, our English word criteria comes from this, where it speaks of you need to meet a certain criteria. Um, and that's a different, that's a different mention altogether. It is never, it is not used in respects to the judging of believers. You will never see Crino in respects to the judgment of believers. So that's important to point out. You'll only see Bema in respects to that of, of how God is going to judge, judge us. Now, this is the outline of biblical usage, uh, to pronounce an opinion concerning right or wrong, again, good or evil kind of thing. Um, to be judged, summoned to the trial that one's case may be examined and judged based, uh, judgment passed upon it. To pronounce judgment to subject to censure of those who act 
the part of judges or arbiters in matters of common life or pass judgment on the deeds and the words of others. So this is like our court of law judgment of whether good or bad. This is more like the Olympics type of thing. And, and that's kind of the image I want to give you guys. So the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ, it looks more like this. When we're in heaven, it looks more like this. Let's let's look at your works. And this is what you built upon. And you will be rewarded based on what you did on 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 the on the on the. On the what, what's the word I'm looking for on like the trial on. I guess on what you did throughout your Christian life and basing it, judging it based on that. Meanwhile, if you're in this kind of court, in this kind of judgment seat with God, this is all right. Let's bring out your dirty laundry. What did you do? And this day you did that. And that day you did that. And this is where we have also the accuser, Satan, um, rallying against us and fighting. Um, except, of course, as I had just mentioned, our day in court was 2000 years ago because we have accepted Christ. It is by that blood that we're paid, that our sins are paid for and we're saved. So in respects to the judgment seat of Christ, it looks a lot more like that. Achievements. Maybe that would be the word on that one. Achievements. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really, really, at, really at a loss for words today. Um, but now let's speak on the, on the three, on the two categories of materials. What classifies gold, silver, and jewels, and what classifies the works that we do as wood, hair, straw? Both are good. It's not that one is bad and one is good, but one is temporary while the other is permanent. So. And, and I really I'm scared of giving examples because I don't know if I'm going to hurt people's feelings or not. But let me just try to give one example because <laughs> um, because I, I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure if, if I'm even right. Um, but let's just say. Let's just say that maybe this constitutes as wood, hay and straw that. Um, oh, you know, but I made a really pretty flyer that said. Um, I don't know. I, it, I I want to be careful, but let's just say that your wood, hay, and straw is that, you know, you worked on a pretty flyer, but, you know, all that work for, for the, it wasn't really feeding into the, the permanence of, of the kingdom of heaven. At the same time, I can already, that's why I was pausing myself. I could already hear a particular Christian arguing back at me and just be like, yeah, but what if that actually helped someone go to church and then they ended up uh, being, so it's hard for me to say. I'm, and I'm not at a comfortable position. I'm not in any position to try to tell you what this is. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what that means. Um, but there are two categories. Maybe one is done in vain and the other is not done in vain. Or maybe one is just completely pointless. Like, oh, who cares if the chair was like this and you spent 18 hours, you know, fixing all the chairs so that it's like that. Maybe that is wood, hay, and straw. Oh, but the chairs were organized, but... Maybe God wanted us to go outside and evangelize and not make sure that all the chairs are in line. Is it important in respects to having a clean and orderly church? Yeah, but is it really gold? Silver? Jewels? It, it's hard because I may I may really press at someone's emotions and, and that even look at my life. Maybe, yeah, maybe there was a period of time where I was focusing so much on wood, hay, and straw. At the same time, though, I want to 
slightly argue back. And there is a verse, I didn't list it here, but it just came to mind now where there's a verse where I believe it's Paul saying that even if the person who is teaching and evangelizing, oh, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Even if they were doing it in vain, yeah, it's still glory to God. But does that mean that it falls into this category? But what if it bore eternal fruit because of it? It's hard to... It's, I mean, I mean, we should we should feel bad. We should feel bad on our intentions. Um, we shouldn't be doing. So I I think that was definitely the Holy Spirit convicting you. At the same time, does that mean that God doesn't want you to do good things because we might have an ulterior motive? Yeah, it, it's a balance. It's a balance because that verse it mentions they're doing it in vain. They're doing it with with those bad intentions. At the end of the day, though. <laughs> God, yes, and the glory. Yeah, that. Yeah, that. That's already a line that. Yeah, that's. Yeah, they're not even working under the authority of God, uh, per se. But but let's keep on reading because I think I did. I do put a a kind of a good gear based on the rewards. So it's hard to classify this, but when you look at the rewards that we receive, the, re the rewards that we receive are crowns. When you pay attention to the crowns, I think you begin to get a better idea as to what these gold, silver, and jewels are. So I believe in order, look at that, I'm just talking to myself. I believe in order to understand the difference, we need to examine the rewards given to the believer. <laughs> five crowns are mentioned in the New Testament as a reward. Does that mean that there's only five crowns? Not necessarily. There could be more crowns, but only five happen to be mentioned in the New Testament. These are the five crowns. There's an incorruptible crown. We, to save time, we're not going to look at these verses, but there's an incorruptible crown for those who get ma who master self-control. So just to categorize it, this one seems a lot more personal because you could master self-control all within your house, per se. Crown of rejoicing for soul winners. Well, this one's a lot more outside. You got to meet people, talk to people, or or technically you could even maybe even do it online nowadays. But this one is is soul winning, um, going out and doing things. Crown of life for those who endure many trials. Now, just because you grew up poor, does that constitute as trials or is it trials endured because you are a follower of Christ? I just throw that up there as, as a point to ponder. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it leans more towards, you know, trials that you go through, not because uh, you wore an ugly dress to school this one day when you were uh, in middle school, but I think it's leaning more towards on the trials that you go through because you are a servant of Christ. Um, so that's, again, going out and, and possibly getting hurt for the things that you believe. Um, again, to put these things in categories. Crown of righteousness for those who love his appearance. Um, well, this one's a lot easier. This is if you love studying eschatology, in, in other words, uh, for those who look forward to Jesus coming back and, and, and pray on that and seek that and, and, and hold steadily to that. Um, so, again, that's one a lot more internal. Um, and then uh, the last one mentioned crown of glory for shepherds. This one's also difficult. You're dealing with people, but you're dealing not with um, the lost. You're dealing with Christians. If you're a shepherd, you're dealing with Christians. So there's a few different categories. Um, all of these received a reward, meaning that they all fall into this. So you could technically be rewarded off of something that is personally happening with you, like the, the self-control thing. It could also be the going out, like the soul winners. Um, and it could also be within the church of, of, of helping others within the church. Um, there, And as I said, are there more than five? Probably, possibly. But at least following this bit of a theme, this is really the only thing we're given. Um, again, at the same time, would, like I used the example, is organizing the chairs every day at church, does that constitute within this any of these categories? Is it really winning souls? Is it really self-control? No, because you could technically go clubbing after or be sinning as you're doing that. Is it enduring many trials? Not necessarily. Is it really loving is appearing? Not necessarily. And is it really shepherding? Not necessarily. A lot of times these come down to individuals. Are we helping out individuals? Or at the same time, this one is, is mastery of self-control. It's a lot more personal. Um, 
But for the most part, most of these categories fall into helping with someone. Um, so what is the theme found in these in these rewards? I'm leaving that blank because I think everyone can add a little bit to that of, of, of what these categories look like, what these themes look like. And let the Holy Spirit talk to you because that's that's something that we all have to debate within ourselves and, and let God speak to us. So that we can examine what we are doing and whether that is what God wants us to be doing. Because um, I think for, for the benefit of God's kingdom, there's obviously a benefit to be here. Um, regardless of the rewards, it, yeah, it's cool the fact that we'll get a crown. Um, but the greater purpose is the fact that we're building on God's kingdom. And he kind of gives us a hint of, hey, you know, these are the things that I value more. Uh, these are the things that are permanent. It is not limited to these five crowns. There may be more. So the gift of a crown. Now, there's a debate whether we would, between theologians, whether we will eternally have these crowns or whether we give it up once to God and that's it. It's hard for me to say. Um but let, let's read this verse from Revelation chapter four and see what it says. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they existed before you were created. So one of the things I want to point out first regarding that debate is the first word that it says, whenever the living beings give glory and thanks to the one sitting on the throne. So whenever this occurs, that occurs. So does that mean that whenever the living beings uh, give glory and honor to God, we lay down our crowns? Then that means the second time that it happens. Does that mean that we got our crowns back and then put it back down? And then got our crowns back and then put it back down. I'm not 100% sure. Is that a one-time event? I was I was uh, traditionally taught that it was a one-time event. Um, both remain true of, of the key. The purpose as to why we lay down the crowns is that, yeah, sure, cool, we got a reward. But at the end of the day, the one who deserves it all is God. And that is us laying down our crowns and saying, God, you are the one who deserves it all. I don't deserve it. You're the one who saved me. You're the one who gave me your strength, your power in order to do these things. I couldn't have done it without you. You're the one who deserves it all. We may have crowns and be sitting on thrones, but you are the ultimate king. You are the king of kings. Um, but now in respects to this, when the living beings give glory and honor, also is that an eternal statement that they do that for all of eternity? Or is this only during the book of Revelation? that they need to be doing this. Um, so it, it's just a point to ponder. And I kind of like doing that every now and then, giving a point to ponder, because um, not a lot of people give those mentions. Um, this is a well-known painting by, by a Christian artist of, of that day, of the 24 elders laying down their crowns. Um, and, and, you know, one day we'll have that, that, that benefit. Um, now again, to those who don't have a crown, are they missing out on anything? Not necessarily. The fact that they're in heaven with God is the ultimate reward. But at the same time, there is a bit of a joy, a bit of a blessing in order to be able to say, God, this crown, I don't deserve it. Glory to you. Glory to you, God. Let, let's take a pause here and start again. Oh, it's been 